many stones are over 400 years old. Can you imagine? And some of them, as you can go through, you'll see a broken. And you know, that's from vandalism. You know what vandalism is? Yeah. yeah. We sure do, don't we? Some people have thrown paint on them over the years. It's terrible. If this was your relatives, you would not want that, would you? No. Someone break their stone? Absolutely not. There are over 267 stones that we can see here that we have photographs of. And on the that's, uh, wall behind you is a, what they call a legend or a list of all the of stones that we could actually find and identify. But on the other side, in 2017, the city did ground penetrating radar. Do you know what that is? When the guy takes the machine and he's hunting for treasure or anomalies in the ground, you've seen that on TV and stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, they did that here and we came up with 400, about 430 unmarked graves where their graves have been destroyed or have gone over the last 400 years. So what we did was we put little silver markers all along and you can see whenever you see a silver marker, that is a burial that has lost its stone or maybe never had a stone because the Puritans, you know, they didn't believe really in stones. On the walkway, when you see a red brick, that means that's a burial underneath there. Okay, so we're gonna walk over here and we'll tell you a little bit about this wonderful place. Here we come. Well, welcome to the first burial ground again. And I wanted to, to explain to you the importance of this cemetery. Do you know the early founders, like in your logo, it says uh, Captain Number Johnson into the wilderness. Well, they, they feel that they're buried here on the earlier graves. It would be down by the fence down in that area there. They do not have any markers left, but maybe they're one of the little silver discs, the anomalies that we did find, right? Do you know what a uh, flag means beside a grave? Yeah. Um, that means, I think they were like a soldier. Right? They were, they were in the military, weren't they? Yeah. From the earliest time, from Captain Edward Johnson, right up until the Revolutionary War. This cemetery is from 1642, when the very first child, or the very first death in Woburn, because they discovered Woburn in 1640, but became a town in 1642. And in 1642, unfortunately, the first death was a little girl, one month old, Hannah Richardson, and she's buried in here. And um, in this cemetery are, are 15 Revolutionary War soldiers. Can you see the Revolutionary War marker? Yeah. Behind Mr. Bryan right here, that's a Revolutionary War marker. And that is for the grave of Daniel Thompson. Do you know who Paul Revere was, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. What is April 19th, 1775? First day of the revolution. First day of the revolution is when they answered the alarm, right, Emma? Yeah, the yep. the, the, yeah but they were all British at that time, weren't they? This is when Americans were, were not coming. called Americans at that time, right? But they had to make a decision in this country, didn't they? Yes. Gee, do we want to be part of England or we want to be our own country? Like Daniel Thompson wanted to be part of our own country. It looks like a pyramid, doesn't it? It's called my, an obelisk because my, of the shape. My, my, uh, my door what, hun? My door is the ball went door lock? Well, maybe that's from him, I don't know. See the two little rocks in the front? Can you see with a, on the hill? You can see a rock on the left, rock on the right? Yeah. If, you, if, if that was to be open, that's the tomb, the entrance to the tomb, and there are between 13 and 18 Baldwin family members who are buried there. So that's really a tomb as opposed to a single grave that you see out here. Colonel Baldwin was a very famous man. He was from North Uber, and you know what Stop and Shop is? Oh yeah, he's coming down, he's hunting. He comes and visits us every day, aren't you lucky? He comes in the morning. Who do you think he's looking for? And it was attacked in 1898, the ship of the USS Maine. So this comment is here to honor all of our military men and women who served in all of the wars from you see in your shirt, Captain Edward Johnson, to Iraq and Afghanistan, and current while on terror. So that's who is on our wall that we'll go and visit in a little bit. But right now, the USS Maine is one of the earliest memorials in here. In 1913, it went in, and it represents the first battleship the United States ever built in Maine, the USS Maine. And in 1898, the Americans went to Cuba. You know what Cuba is? It's below Florida, right? We go to Disney World. It's a different country, correct? So went down there, they sent this ship to protect American citizens. Because there was trouble with Spain. And what happened is one night, the men on this, the men on this ship, they put a bomb underneath. And while they were sleeping, they blew up this ship. And all the Marines and sailors 
almost 300 of them died at the bottom of the Havana Bay. But that was the start of the Spanish-American War in 1898. And what happened was a very short war, thank goodness. And a year later, they decided, the United States, to go all the way back to Havana Harbor and bring up this beautiful ship, because it was our first battleship. And when they did that, you see the number 10 on here? It's the 10th artifact that they brought up from the ocean. And when they did that, we were allowed to buy this. The businessmen bought it in 1913, and it's been here ever since. So this is to honor the Spanish-American War veterans. Everybody out loud. days a year, even nights and weekends and holidays and everything like that. 
There's a lot of different things, as you can tell, that we watch here at the control room for the water treatment plant. One of the things we pay attention to are the chlorine levels and all the different chemical levels that we use to uh, inject into the water. You're going to see that in a minute when we head down back. Wait, Another, in No, in the drinking water. Another important thing that we pay attention to are the water tanks all around the city. Does everybody know where Library Field is? Yes. You know that big brown water tank up on the hill that you can see? Yes. Right, so that's Rag Rock water tank. So that's a four million gallon water tank. I've been there before. Another thing we pay attention to is the weather a lot. If we get a lot of rain, where does all that water go? Water <coughs> tank. Goes down into the ground and into the pond. So if all the water goes into the ground, that means that we can pump more water. And the last thing you can see before we head down back, you can see all the different security cameras, right? It's very important in the middle of the night when no one's here that we have all sorts of cameras around the water treatment plant and the water tanks so that no one's down here messing around or breaking in or doing anything they shouldn't be doing. So everything calls out. Everything goes to a computer and calls my cell phone in the middle of the night so we know that there's a problem down here. We're going to head down back down the hallway to the chemical room. <laughs> Mr. Odette, Al Odette, 
who just died recently, a couple of months ago, at 100 years old. He was a great guy. And um, he flew planes. He was um, a navigator in a plane. And what happens is his plane got hit. By, and this is World War II now, so 1941 to 1945. Some of your great grandfathers would have been in World War II. Uh, so your great great grandfathers in some cases. Um, Mr. L. Audet, um, he got shot down. His plane got shot down by the Germans. And when he did, the scarf that you see around his neck actually is his parachute. So what happens is when he came out, he had to have a parachute, he landed in the water, he took a piece of it to save, to remember the time that his life was saved by the parachute. And this here is a nurse's uniform. I mean, that's actual blood that's on there from World War II. And um, she took care of the wounded soldiers. And that up here. You can see it afterwards, okay? Brothers here. Here's two sets of brothers. Mary told you about Foley Beach and swimming and everything and working in the tanneries. These two brothers, the McHugh brothers, um, they lived down that way. And um, one was killed one year, then the mother's brother. Are you all listening? Yes. I shouldn't hear anybody. And the mother, she got one letter that her son died, and then not a year later, her other son died. So it must have been very hard for her, don't you think? Very painful. Do you know where Perulo Field is? Up in yeah. Mount Fulman? No. That's named after my uncle, Jackie Perulo. He got killed in World War II. And that's him right there. Real handsome. He was the captain of the baseball team in 1939. He was in high school. And he was a great uh, artist also. Around here, this is World War I. And World War I represents 1916 to 1919. And many wounded men served in World War I. And this gentleman, he's, his shirt, he's wounded also. You'll see the blood on his uniform when you um, come around. And this here is actually um, one of the um, bowler knives that they would have carried. Do you know Mr. Johnson? He was in the pumping station where he wore a special mask. And the mask was what? To protect him, right? From chemicals and whatever. If you stand up and hold it up to me, can you, right there, it's a gas mask, okay? Yeah, hold the green part too, okay? Yeah, and you can hold it up as high as you can so they can see. This is the gas mask they would have worn in World War I. And it's a big difference, don't you think? Big difference. The horses, dogs, all the animals wore this also in World War I when they fought over in France. Thank you, honey, put it down, thank you. And then over here is Civil War veterans from Woburn. And then behind you, are the ones in the Civil War, you know I told you about Roscoe uh, Bryant and his brother who died in the prison camps? Those are soldiers from uh, the Civil War. That's an actual dress. In the back is a Civil War uniform, a Civil War dress, 1860. And on the back, in the back room, you're going to see the Revolutionary War. We talked about um, Count Rufford is in his lobster back. That's his jacket. That's the jacket there. That's Revolutionary War in the back, the women. And then you see an actual cradle. And on the right of the tannery, where the hide is, we talked about it. And this here is a Civil War uniform right here. So do you want to hear about Saddu study? Do you hear about Saddu study? No. Okay, okay. All right, ready? What is it? First of all, it's a dog. This is a Boston Bull Terrier. Oh, my God. And the Bull Terrier, World War One. Okay? He was a war hero, a war dog, but he was a stray dog. So when the soldiers in 1916 were practicing in the field down at Yale University in Connecticut, what they did was they were drilling and drilling, getting ready to go overseas to France to fight in the war of World War I. This little dog kept following them around, following them around, and it was like, okay, uh, you know, no one gets no home. So one of the soldiers, one of the soldiers took an interest in him and said, well, we'll take care of them. So that's what they did. So for weeks and weeks, this dog lived with all the soldiers training in World War I. So finally, they get their orders. You know what? You now have to go overseas to France to fight. What are they going to do with this poor little dog? He has nowhere to go, right? Yeah, what? So anyone, anyway, they took him, and they snuck him on the ship. So they're out to sea and going to France, and all of a sudden, the dog starts barking, and the captain of the ship captain of the ship 
says, who has a dog on this boat? And they were like, no. they had to fess up that they had him, correct? So the dog, you know, he, he went before the captain and the soldier had to salute the captain. And guess who else saluted? Captain mm -hmm. Study. They had taught him how to salute. So the, dog, the captain was so impressed, this dog is so smart, they said, you know what, you can keep him and take him with the rest of the soldiers. So he went on to France. This dog would fight in 17 battles in World War I, actual battles. And one time he got wounded, he received the Purple Heart, and one time he got gassed with the gas that that mask would have protected. They didn't have them on the dogs and horses then. So what happened was, you want us to know how he saved his soldiers' lives, hundreds of them? What happened is they're in the battlefield and they're fighting. And what, what developed was the dog now, he could understand, the, he understood the smell, the gas, because he was gassed already. But he could also, do dogs have good hearing? No. no. Great hearing. No, they have great hearing. So the dogs, the dogs could hear the whistling of the rockets coming in with that poison mustard gas. That's what they called it. So he would... He barked and barked and went all around and warned the soldiers, put your mask on, the gas is coming in. So when they did that, he saved the lives of hundreds of his soldiers that he saved. Do you want to know how he captured a German spy? He captured a German spy. The German spy was in the woods with a machine gun and he was ready for waiting for the American soldiers to come. And then he was going to gun them down. The dog grabbed him. Where do you think he grabbed him? No, he bit him on the bum. He grabbed him so hard that he pulled him to the ground. And then the Americans came by. The Americans came by and then they captured him as a POW. But the dog saved he got him received a medal for that. The dog lived to be ten years old. He died in 1926, and they were so proud of him. See, the, he has a jacket on. See, he has a military jacket. The license for Yankee Division. And those are all of his medals that he won.